Yeah, welcome back from spring break. Anybody have any exciting things? I got to ride a lot of dirt bikes. <laughs> I fell this time twice. It's uh, it's kind of too tall for me, and so I, um, in order to prevent like a worse accident, I stopped real fast. But then, man, <laughs> I, there was no place to put my foot down because I was kind of on a, a ridge, and, and I, I fell the correct way. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, but Jennifer was pretty panicked. <laughs> Because she didn't see it. Katie goes, oh, dad took a spill. And so the car heart starts. Going. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Uh, Thomas and I had a great time. Yeah. Longest jump yet. So anyway, maybe it's like a foot. But... <laughs> yeah, they're fixing the motor across for sure. So uh, to remind us from last time, we talked about pressure, temp pressure composition phase diagrams, PX curves. And today we're going to flip that y-axis and talk about temperature composition curves. So... So we'll jump in. So comparing this to what we talked about before spring break, if you look on the left, this is what we talked about last time. So on the y-axis, we had vapor pressure or pressure. Okay. And, and this, this red curve is actually the vapor, vapor line. And this black curve here, or straight line, is the liquid phase line. And so up above, we have the liquid phase at high pressure. So like if you could put the, fill the whole container with liquid and put it up at, you know, two, two atmospheres in this particular diagram at 298, it would all be liquid. There would be no meniscus. There'd be no, no vapor. But if you come down here, let's say you, you release the pressure down to one atmosphere, and now you have a meniscus and you have vapor above that liquid, it has one atmosphere of vapor pressure and has this composition here. So remember the definitions that YA is the vapor phase composition and XA is the liquid phase composition. <clears throat> so in looking at this curve, how do we know which side is the liquid phase and the vapor phase of these curves? Think about the pressure axis. So at really low pressure, we have vapor. At really high pressure, we have liquid. So if you squeeze on that vapor, eventually you'll fill, you know, like you'll squeeze all of the vapor into the liquid phase, and then your piston is just touching liquid. There's no meniscus left. Okay. It's where you have these lines that you have the two phases in equilibrium. Okay. And then this is the pure substance vapor pressure. So we're talking about uh, the mole fraction of A. So way over here, this is the pure vapor pressure of A at this temperature. And so this has the highest pressure. So that's a very volatile substance. Okay. And then this is a really low pressure at, at room temperature. And so this is a, not a very, very volatile substance. So it has a low vapor pressure. And then here's one atmosphere. So this would be the boiling point. So the normal boiling point for this thing would be above room temperature because at room temperature, look, it's vapor pressure is only like 0.75 atmospheres. So we'd have to raise this substance's uh, temperature to get the pure vapor pressure to hit one. Somebody see that? So this is a, a boiling point that's below, uh, that is a, the boiling point is above room temperature because the vapor pressure is below one atmosphere. Over here, this substance, uh, the pure vapor pressure is much higher than one atmosphere at this temperature. And so it is, if you had that pure substance at, at room temperature, it would have all boiled away and we would be over here in a pure vapor phase area. Okay, We would have to cool this substance A down and here it would start to condense at one atmosphere. Okay. And so then this is the boiling points of all of the mixtures in between. And so uh, wherever this, uh, like right here, if you follow this liquid line, that would be the composition. So this would be the boiling point of the liquid composition XA. So that would, that XA composition would boil at room temperature because that's the temperature for this phase diagram. Okay, everybody kind of gets a review of last time. And then the, the vapor phase, if we were to sample the vapor above that boiling liquid, would have the YA composition. So this would be enriched in substance A, because substance A has a higher natural vapor pressure. So it would, it would be enriched in A in the, in the vapor phase. Okay. Now we take this diagram, which we don't use very much, uh, at least in our chemistry 
uh, academic side of things, we use temperature on the y-axis more frequently. And so now let's compare everything. This is um, over here. Room temperature is roughly 300, right? 298, so 300. So this is the, the um, phase diagram at one atmosphere. And here's all the temperatures. And so just like I said, for, for substance A, we would have to lower the temperature to get uh, its vapor pressure down to one atmosphere. And here's that temperature over here for substance A. It would be 200 and what? 250, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Yeah, so there would be 260 roughly. And so that, since this is at one atmosphere, substance A at 260 would have a vapor pressure of one atmosphere. So that's the boiling point for substance A. And for substance B up here, again, we said I'd have to raise the temperature to get it to boil if it was pure. And so here's the boiling point of substance B. So this is uh, 310, 20, 25, so 325. Again, this is the vapor pressure. Uh, this is the, the TX curve at one atmosphere. So that's the boiling point for substance B. Is everybody cool with that? We have our pure boiling points on either side because this is this is the diagram is set up for one atmosphere. Okay. And then that same mixture boils at room temperature. That XA mixture, room temperature here, has a pressure of one atmosphere. Okay. And so XA would, if we were in the pure liquid phase, another thing that's swapped is over here at the low temperatures, we'd have liquid. At high temperatures, we'd have pure vapor. At intermediate temperatures, we have the two phases in equilibrium. And so the liquid phase is on the bottom of this diagram and the vapor phase is on the top. See how that's reversed in the pressure one and so. So now this top curve is the vapor composition line and the bottom curve is the liquid composition line. So if we take XA and we boil it, we come right over here to the vapor phase, and this is the composition of the vapor phase coming off of that liquid. So if it's in the boiling flask, that vapor is enriched in A because A has a lower boiling point. So I'll pause here for any kind of things that you want to clarify. It's going to get more complicated, so make sure you understand this one. <laughs> Do the little piston diagrams help? Let's let's draw one down here. So down here we have a little movable volume and it's compressed down here where we have um, all liquid. And then we, we, let's see, let me think about this. Let's do the piston diagram over on the pressure curve because that makes more sense. We're changing the pressure. Okay. so. So up here we have a high pressure, so our piston is down in the bottom and it's liquid only. Liquid phase. Okay, and down here in the vapor phase, I've got my piston way out and it's vapor only. And then in the middle here, let's just pick a spot like right here. We've got an intermediate pressure and I've got some liquid. I'll draw a little waves. Okay, you see that? So we have some liquid phase here and some vapor phase on top in this middle region. So we have two phases in equilibrium. If I keep pulling on that piston and putting in heat to, uh, you know, follow a, I guess, a, an isotherm, a 298 Kelvin then I will, I will uh, pull it out and it'll be all vapor, okay? If I push that piston in and sink the heat because I'm compressing it, um, eventually I push all the liquid into the, get into the solid, uh, in, I'll push all the vapor into the liquid phase and I have nothing but liquid inside my piston. Let's 
take this one and let's make a balloon, something flexible, right? That look like a little balloon. It's got a little knot tied on it. Okay, and it's all liquid down here. I should have drawn a smaller balloon for the liquid phase, but anyway. <laughs> and now it's in one atmosphere and balloons are flexible, right? So we start raising the temperature, okay? And we raise the temperature up way up here where we have this huge balloon that's supposed to be a lot bigger, okay? And it's all vapor. This is all liquid. And then somewhere in the middle, we have an intermediate balloon where you've got a meniscus, where the liquid phase is here and the vapor phase is here. Everybody follow that? Yeah, so it maintains one pressure, one atmosphere pressure because it's in a flexible container. We just raise the temperature. And when we move through that two phase region, we have a meniscus, we have liquid and vapor in equilibrium. Okay. All right, so that's the PX and TX phase diagrams. So this is what we use in terms of uh, the understanding distillation. So here's a thermal image. I bought the, years ago, I bought this nice little attachment to my iPhone 5. Okay, that's how old it was, right? <laughs> and uh, I could take pictures in the infrared. So here's a distillation, fractional distillation column taken with an infrared camera. And so the, um, the, of course, the you can tell what's going on. The yellow or bright white is hot and the purple is cold, okay? And you see a temperature gradient. You see the hot pot down at the bottom where you're heating up the mixture. And then you see the distillation column. Now there's a little bit of a change in, in temperature here, but that's because there's that glass sleeve. Okay, so it's shielding a little bit of the heat. Okay, but there's a temperature gradient from hot to cold going up that, that fractional distillation column. And we have the chain in there just to provide a lot of surface area so we don't get any jetting. Um, you want the molecules to interact with the glass and, and everything along this temperature gradient. So you want a lot of collisions. And sometimes we put glass beads in there and give a really torturous path. And it's a slow distillation, but it's the most accurate in, 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 uh, in separating boiling points. And so that's the condensate temperature. So up here is the, the coldest temperature in this column is at the top. The hottest temperature is down here in the pot. And, and so this, uh, if you have a, a low boiling substance, it's gonna condense on that little thermometer. This whole area is at that same temperature. And over here you have cooling water in this condenser. And so when it hits that cooling water, it turns to a liquid and then drips down here into the, into the collection flask. That, that column is called the fractioning column. And this is called the still bottom, also known as the pot, okay? Um, is still bottoms is actually a category of waste. So if you do this a lot and you produce still bottoms, that's a category of waste. Uh, you, the pure substances are in the condensate. So even if you think you're going to distill, say, a non-volatile or a, let's say a more volatile substance from a less volatile substance, you never have pure still bottoms. So you have all of the non-volatile residue and the least volatile compound all mixed together. So you're not going to have a pure still bottom. You're going to have a pure condensate. And so that's the pot boiling temperature and up at the top is the condensate temperature. So let's compare this to a TX phase diagram. So we have a couple of different T TX uh, diagrams here. And <clears throat> if you look at say the analytical textbook when you're talking about gas chromatography, do y'all remember the concept of theoretical plates? Kinda in instrumental. Did y'all have y'all had instrumental yet? So a few people. Okay. Well, in instrumental, they talk about separations, and they would talk about the number of plates needed to separate things, and that was confusing technology terminology. And they talked about calculating the number of theoretical plates, and it's sort of the the idea of if I boil this substance here, this is the pot, right? and it comes up here and it boils at that temperature, which is a high temperature, okay? But the vapor has this composition and that composition has a condensate temperature that's lower. And so as it moves up that fractioning column, 
the temperature of the walls of the column are getting cooler as they move away from the heating mantle. And they're bouncing off of those walls. And as they hit walls that are this temperature, there's still vapor. And his temperature, there's still vapor. But eventually they hit the wall where it is the perfect temperature to condense that vapor. And anything lower than that would also condense it. So it's sampling the wall because that's what molecules do. They bounce all over the place. And it's moving up that fractioning column away from the heating source. And eventually it hits a part of the glass that's just right. <laughs> and it sticks. And other molecules hit it in the stick and it forms a droplet. Okay. And that droplet has this composition. So it comes across, this is the vapor line. And this is the liquid line. And it forms a liquid. What happens when that liquid runs down the wall of the fractioning column? It heats back up. And so guess what? It heats up and boils. So it comes along here, it drops down, and then it boils and comes across here. Now the vapor is really enriched in the, low, in the lower boiling substance. Because it's now it's sampling the wall, and it goes a little higher, because the higher you go, the cooler it is. And so now we hit a, a temperature where it's this cool and that vapor can condense. And so it condenses way up high of the column. And then it starts to roll down by gravity and it gets to a hotter part of the column and it boils off again. And so when it boils off again, then you get to this vapor composition. And you can see this is almost pure B now. So, so A is on the left, B is on the right in this particular diagram. And so way up at the top, that thermometer you're gonna have pure B condensing on that thermometer and hitting the condenser and going over to the condensate. And so this will be collected. The lower boilers will be collected in fractional distillation. Does that make sense? Now, the, look at the, this difference in the vapor and liquid curves. So the greater the distance in these vapor liquid curves, the easier it is to separate. In just three steps, we got almost pure B. But over here, look how close these are. So these steps are very close together. And so it takes five steps to get close to pure B. And so this would be five theoretical plates on the right and three theoretical plates on the left. So how many zigzags you make in a TX diagram, you could think of as these theoretical plates. But what is the idea of a plate? That's the thing that confused me. And I asked that, I remember as an undergraduate, I asked that question, why use the word plates? And the, the professor said, it refers back to the bubble plate distillation, which we don't use anymore. And he said, so, so bubble plates, essentially, he said, don't exist anymore. And then years later, I got my PhD, and then I'm at an ACS talk, and we had a speaker come through, and he was talking about chemical engineering and, and refineries and so on. And he said something about bubble plates. And I raised my hand in the talk and I said, you just said bubble plates. I thought those weren't used anymore. And he looked at me like I was from Mars. And he said, every refinery uses bubble plates. So my professor had never been off campus. <laughs> right? so, so we use bubble plates in every chemical plant and every refinery. We just don't use them in the labs, in the academic labs. And so we'll see some pictures of bubble plates later. But that's what the plate means in theoretical plate. So let's compare now this, um, these uh, theoretical plates to our fractional distillation. So down here at the, at the pot boiling temperature, this temperature here is down there. Okay, so that's the high temperature. We're starting with this mixture in the pot <clears throat> or the still bottom. And then you could just number these temperatures like one, two, three, four, and five. And you see that pure substance is being collected by the, by the condenser and in the collection flask. So pure B. Okay. And this is A plus B plus NVR. NVR, non-volatile residue. And in fact, if you wanted to test for non-volatile residue, Sometimes we do that. We will take a flask of pure solvent that's supposed to pass a non-volatile residue test and we'll boil it away. So we'll take 300 mils of solvent and boil it away almost to dryness. Um, then we'll 
finish it off maybe in an oven or something like that to where we'll take it to dryness and then we'll extract it with a, a pure solvent and then put it in a weigh boat or something like that and measure the mass of the non-volatile residue. Because some of these solvent tests uh, for high purity solvents are, you know, so and so many milligrams or micrograms per hundred mils, you know, so or per liter. So does everybody see what's going on with the TX diagram and with distillation? So the remember this is temperature here, so this is the low boiler. And that low boiling substance ends up in the collection flask. So that's a critical piece of information. Now, what happens to the pot? Well, notice that we're losing B, right? Because B is being collected. And so as those drops re-evaporate, some of the that rich in A liquid dribbles down all the way back to the pot. And so the composition of the pot, as we lose the excess B, will move towards A. And you say, oh, well, that's great because I'll end up with pure A in the pot. But if I, if I remove all of the B, I end up with A and non-volatile residue. And that's the most chemically reactive area in the whole setup. And so A might be breaking down and decomposing. And so you've got reaction products. It's open to air. So you've got oxygen in there. So you have oxidation products and so on. So the pot is never pure. You just can't depend upon the pot being pure. It's going to have non volatile residue for sure. And your boiling chips, who knows what those had on them. <laughs> and all the other stuff, the stir bar, whatever, you know. There's a lot of stuff in the pot. So you can't look at this and say, oh, I can separate B and A and have A and B pure. Okay. The only way to purify A is to put it in a, a, a higher boiling solvent and distill A off. And then you get pure A. If you, if you just can't get A to boil because it'll decompose, let's say it's an oily substance, then you need to do like, like a microfiltration or something else to, to get A. You know, do other way, there's other ways to purify a substance than distillation. But the, for the volatile substances, distillation is the way to go. Okay. And so this was our actual temperatures for this uh, particular diagram. So this was uh, 128 degrees Fahrenheit and up here was 105. That was way down there. Okay. So here's the theoretical plate. I told you about that. This is the sort of a picture of what's going on in a refinery fractioning column. We have these little plates here. Um, so more plates equals better separation. And, and so now we can calculate sort of how many of these separating plates would give us a certain amount of separation. And so we do that for our chromatography resolution calculations. So we have, a, um, this is the pot down here. This is the fractioning column. So the, the vapor goes up through these little bubble plates and out. And so then you have all of these little vapor condensates. And then this right here is a little tube where it it's kind of like a waterfall. It go, this fills up above the level of that tube and then flows down. And so the really volatile stuff goes up through these bubble plates. And it mixes intimately with the next liquid. And then the, the less volatile liquid flows over this weir. So this is a W-E-I-R. So you know how a waterfall works, right? It fills up and then it flows over the edge. Okay, so this is a tube. So there's a certain level at which it gets to, and then it'll flow over and go down that tube into the next bubble plate below. So the volatile stuff's going up through the bubble caps, and then the non-volatile liquid, as it builds up, it flows back through the weir and down to the, the previous plate. And then you can pull taps at different temperatures. So remember, we have a really high temperature down here, we have a cold temperature at the top. We have intermediate temperatures here. And so we put taps at these different bubble plates and we pull off different products. And so this might be um, diesel. 
and this might be gasoline. And that's how we separate our crude oil. So we just run it through these bubble plates and we pull off the different fractions. That's why there's no sort of molecular formula for diesel because it's just a boiling point range. Whatever that bubble plate holds is the range of boiling temperatures for diesel. And then the, the next one up or two up would be uh, gasoline. And it has a range of boiling points. So it's a lot of mixtures of hydrocarbons, maybe some oxygenates in there, some alcohols, some ketones, aldehydes, but they all have a range of boiling points because they're all in that same bubble plate. And so then you tap them and pull them off. And it's simple. I mean, this, we dig a hole in the ground, we pull out this really complex fluid, we put it in a pot, warm it up. Out comes diesel, out comes gas, out comes white gas, jet fuel, liquid petroleum products, propane off the top. <laughs> it's, it's easy. There's nothing easier than that. You just need a heat source and a lot of tubing. Okay. And so here's a close-up of the, of the various bubble plates. Here's a picture of the waterfall, the weir. Okay. Um, notice the rising vapors come up and they, they bubble under the level of the liquid and they fill up that that plate there and then they the vapor goes up and bubbles up if it's still volatile at that temperature it'll boil and go up to the next one and if it's still volatile it keeps going up but if it's con condensed at that temperature uh, eventually it'll it'll flow back down and we can put taps on there like it shows here kerosene gasoline here's a picture of the actual bubble plate you see all the little bubbles plates there i mean the little bubble caps and the little bubble cap has a has a gap in it and then it comes out of that gap and it has to flow down under the liquid so there's a lot of mixing and then out these little these little vents and so if it's a really at that temperature if it's still a gas it'll bubble out and if it's at that temperature and it cond condenses then it stays in the liquid so we have a good mixing of the liquid and vapor phases so they come to equilibrium and we can run this at a pretty high rate that's why we you know we want to have barrels and barrels of oil and gas and so on coming out of this. So we need to run it at a pretty high rate. So we need lots of contact between the vapor bubbles and the liquid levels. And this is a nice uh, picture. Here's a fractioning column on the right. And you see that there's a tap coming off the side here. I just grabbed an industrial picture. I don't know what, this may be like a chemical plant or something, and that may be some of the kind of fractioning column. But, but you see those kinds of um, towers at all the refineries, those are all fractioning columns. If it's a catalytic column, there's no reason to have it vertical. You can have catalytic columns and other kinds of separators and stuff um, on the, you know, horizontal, much easier to maintain. But the vertical ones are, are using volatility to separate or maybe gravity, maybe there's a water separator. And so you have a high volume mixture coming in and you want it to settle and separate and you have a water layer and a, and a liquid layer. One may, you know, depending on the densities, one's on top versus the other. And so, so this is a fractioning tower, the maintenance platforms, fraction tap, and so on. So here's a picture of a refinery and all of the different products that we get out of crude oil. Again, hot to cold in that vertical um, space. So we have this fractioning tower and we have uh, you know, liquid petroleum gas. So things like um, butanes and propanes coming off the top, then gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel, uh, aviation fuel and then we have these heavier oils which can can be cracked wherever there's a double bond you can put that through a catalytic cracker and break it, that molecule if there's any double bonds and some of the oil they will calculate what's called a DBE a double bond equivalent so in this gasoline fraction is it 30 percent double bonds or 50 percent double bonds and that'll tell you how much gasoline you can squeeze out of the heavies and so you crack those uh, with the catalytic cracking unit and cracking those uh, larger molecules into smaller molecules and then you get more gasoline. A one to two percent improvement in the amount of gasoline you get can be in the billions of dollars. Yeah, so Wilkinson's catalyst, you might learn about that in advanced inorganic. He upped the percentage of gasoline to diesel and so on by just a percent or two. He got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, he's a rhodium catalyst and that's you know impressive so then you the stuff that just won't fly right you boil it and boil it and boil it and what's left over is just like heavy tars and 
solids. It's called residuum. You've boiled all the volatiles out and you're left with the pot that's full of black coal-like substance and you have to drill it out. And so that's called a coke, uh, coker. You drill out that solid and pulverize it. And it's a pretty dirty coal, but it's, it's useful for fuel. So you can use that to burn. Uh, um, so you can burn it as you burn coal. You can pulverize it and mix it with air and it'll burn. Um, but there's a lot of, again, non-volatile residue in there and, and you need to scrub that stack pretty bad. And then you have asphalt base too. So that heavy tar you mix with gravel and drive on it. <laughs> okay, so we try to squeeze every molecule out of the crude oil that we pull out of the ground because there's a use for every one of them. And some of the heavy oils too, then we send off to um, purify and we might make uh, other products, lubrication oils or even polymers. Some of those double bonds can be used uh, in polymers and plastics. So now we're gonna switch things up and we're gonna take our, our temperature composition diagrams and kind of split them in two because we know from organic, sometimes you can't separate things with fractional distillation. You have azeotropes. And what is an azeotrope? Well, here's your definition of an azeotrope. An azeotrope is a solution whose liquid and vapor composition are the same. That's, that's the simplest, most clear definition. So notice if I have this particular composition here and I boil that, here's my boiling point, and what's the vapor composition line? It's the same. So this is an azeotrope. Okay. Now this particular azeotrope is a high boiler. Notice this right here is the highest temperature. because it's higher than either pure A or pure B. And so it's gonna stay in the pot. And so the pot will not go towards, um, you know, towards uh, pure A or pure B. If we're on this side, remember the low boilers are what's collected. So if we're over here on this side, this is the mole fraction of A. So this is pure A. If we're on this, if we're at A right here, then we're going to collect pure A. We're going to drop down, just draw your little diagram, your little zigzags, and you end up at A. If we're on this side, let's say we're right here and we boil this, then it goes this way and we collect pure B. And the pot will move towards the azeotrope. So the pot follows the lower line, the, the, um, the vapor, you know, what's the condensate would follow the upper line and, and work its way down. So on either side of this, we could get either pure A out or pure B out, but we will never, never separate that pot completely. Okay. Eventually the temperature of the pot rises and we would start collecting this, you know, um, uh, pure azeotrope. Okay, let's look at a low boiler. So an example would be ethanol water. That's a low boiling azeotrope. So if I'm right here and I boil that mixture up here, I hit this point. Notice how the blue and the black curves pinch right there. And so the vapor composition is the same as the liquid composition. So that's by definition an azeotrope. And if I started here at A1 and I boil it, this is the boiling point. The vapor is enriched in the azeotrope and then it drops down it boils again in the fractioning column, drops down, boils again, and it ends up at the azeotrope. So the, the vapor composition approaches B, so this is collected. So this is a low boiler. So it will be the condensate. It will be in the collection flask. And if I'm on this side, the pot will approach pure A plus NBR. Okay, so you can't purify A that way, but you can, you have the pot that'll be enriched in A and have any non-volatile residue. If I'm on this side, notice here's the azeotrope. If I'm on this side, I have more B than the azeotrope would like. And so that pot's gonna be enriched in B. 
So the pots go to wherever the high side is and the, the condensate goes to the low side. Any questions on this? Notice it's really the same kind of fractional distillation, but it's the diagram split in two. Wherever the azeotrope is, that sort of creates two TX diagrams. So if I'm on this side, I, I treat it just like a pure TX diagram. I just draw, I could just draw a line right there. And on the left, the azeotrope's the low boiler. On the right is pure A. And I treat it like a fractional distillation where the azeotrope is collected no matter what. And on this side, I've got pure B on the left, the azeotrope on the right. Azeotrope's a low boiler, so it's going to be collected in a fractional distillation. Over here, I can take this diagram and split it in half and treat it like a fractional distillation. But now the azeotrope stays in the pot and pure A is collected or pure B is collected if I'm on this side. So if I'm over here, then the diagram goes this way. So you shouldn't be bothered by azeotropes. They're just special compositions where the, where the um, vapor and the liquid pinch and they, they have sort of, they behave like a substance. Um, it's just a particular combination of uh, A and B that, that is stable, you know, and so um, there's nothing magic about them. There's really, you don't have to figure out how like in a mole ratio, they all connect in space or anything like that. It's just a, it's just the, the vapor liquid equilibrium and the way it works out. So any questions to clarify or any, uh, for this, any, anything you want straightened out? It does get a little more complicated. Here's all of the types of azeotropes from the CRC handbook. And we've talked about this one, the low boiling azeotrope and the high boiling azeotrope. So we've covered both of those. You see the little pinch points here where the vapor and the liquid lines touch each other. We talked about them in terms of a temperature composition phase diagram. The pressure phase com pressure composition diagram also has pinches, but you see how they're inverted from temperature, right? If you have a low temperature, that means a high vapor pressure. And this is an interesting curve, the way that CRC draws it. So XA is across, or X, yeah, XA is across the X, uh, the X axis, and y is, uh, y is on the Y axis. And so this is the vapor line, and you see where it crosses the liquid line. That's where the vapor and liquid composition would equal each other. And so wherever this crosses in terms of XA, that's where these pinch points are. And then here's the, here's the other one. This one crosses here. Um, and so that's where, again, the X, where that pinch point is. Now we're going to get into others. This is a weird one. This is a double azeotrope, okay. where you have a low boiler here and you have a high boiler here. And so you would just divide that diagram into three. And you could treat this as fractional distillation too. If I had a 50-50 mixture, the collection flask would contain the low boiler and the pot would move up to the high boiling azeotrope. But what a weird thing that would be, this solution, if you had a double azeotrope, because you, you know you mixed uh, substance A and it has this boiling point and substance B has this boiling point. You make a mixture and none of the boiling points match, either A or B. <laughs> right? So uh, the pot boils at some other temperature and the condensate comes out at a really low temperature and, and then none of those match the temperature of A or B. And so you would definitely tell, you know, you look at your temperatures of the condensate and you're like, hmm, this doesn't match the most volatile substance. Therefore, I may have an azeotrope. And so, now here we get into partial miscibility. So you see this straight line here? We're going to talk about that next time. So these three have phase separation. So in the liquid phase, you have two different layers. And so you have phase separation, they're not miscible, and then you have the vapor equilibrium above that. So that's, that gets kind of complicated. So we're gonna wait on the phase separation, the partial miscibility, and just focus on the, the azeotropes and the, and the boiling behavior. So let's do a top hat to finish out. Okay, so I've got some letters on the diagram there. 
Where will the most volatile substance be found after fractional distillation? Okay. You should check. What did you buy it through the bookstore? You need to I set did. that account. I, I have to back up my book. Okay. They said it would uh, kick in this week, I think, the access problems. And so you might want to check the, them on that. Okay. I'm just answering what I don't want to All right. Let's see what we got here. That's right. Phone a friend. Is that show still still going? All right, so a lot of, the majority says D, and that's good. In the collection flask, because it's most volatile, so it's going to have the lowest boiling point. It's going to end up in the collection flask. Okay, if we have a high boiling azeotrope, where will it be found after fractional distillation? Sign language. <laughs> that one, yeah, okay. That's all I know, too. It's <laughs> rising in the sun or something like that. So, thank you. Thank you, yeah. There we go. All right, let's see what y'all did. All right, in the still bottom. That's right, it's a high boiler, right? So the highest boiling substance will be in this remaining in the still bottom. Uh, it's, you know, that's where the heat is and it just can't leave. So all the volatile stuff leaves. And the non-volatile residue and the highest boiler will be in the still bottom. So we have lots of things going on. This is a vocabulary test, too, in terms of what does the word gradient mean? So where is the temperature gradient during fractional distillation? <clears throat> you should try texting your um, answer. See the code? We'll try that next time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, majority says B. Let's see if they're right. Yay. Okay, very good. Yeah, so this is the this is the heating mantle. It's going to be fixed at the boiling point of whatever the pot is. Okay, so the pot has the highest boiling point and that's gonna be stuck. So there's no gradient here. This is the coldest pot this part of the um, fractioning column, so there's no gradient there. It's at a fixed temperature at the at the condensate temperature. So whatever condenses on that thermometer is held at a constant temperature of that condensate. B is the region where there's a gradient. So that gradient is a slope or a change in temperature. And then D is just ambient temperature for the room. The, so there we go. All right, y'all have a great day. It's a good start to the week. Have a great rest of your week. Yes. Um.